Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Hello, Valerie. Today, we have a great talk. We're very excited to bring it to you. So without any further ado, Valerie, if you would please introduce yourself to everybody and go ahead and I'll be here if you need anything. Absolutely. Thank you. And welcome, everyone, to AI4 2020 conference. Today, we're going to be discussing deep fakes. Let me start sharing my screen so we can get started. I have a lot of materials I'd like to review with you. Okay, so good afternoon again. My name is Valerie Drew. Today we're going to be discussing the malicious use of artificial intelligence. We're going to take a look at how deep fakes attacks have already occurred. A couple of them we're going to view. And then we're going to uh, dive into two case studies. One is on the deep fake creations conducted by the Kelly School of Business from Indiana University. And then the second is on the IBM research creation of artificial intelligence malware, and the name of it is Deep Blocker. So why don't we go ahead and get started? So what are deep fakes? So if you saw the movie Forrest Gump, when Forrest actually met President Kennedy, you witnessed a deep fake. If you also saw the movie Fast and Furious version 7, when Van Diesel drove his car along the road and then Paul Walker drove up alongside of him, unfortunately, we know that that was a deep fake because Paul Walker was no longer with us. So what is a deep fake? A deep fake is the image, audio, or video creation of people who are present at an event or involved in a conversation that did not occur. Deep fakes are generated by large amounts of data that are then manipulated through algorithms uh, for AI, which samples their face, their voice, audio, or a bunch of things that we are going to look at in a few moments. Take for instance, how deep fakes are created and how they actually affect our environment. Suppose you have a deep fake creation of terrorists speaking to each other, discussing what they're going to attack, what they're going to do. You can imagine the hysteria that this will cause. Likewise, what if there was a deep fake about government leaders? There's a lot of materials about our government leaders on the internet. You have pictures of Donald Trump in the White House. You have pictures of him on Air Force One at different events, on the golf course, so forth and so on. So creating a deep fake from someone who's very famous or a politician is very easy to do. Can you imagine the impact it would have on the world if there was a deep fake creation of Donald Trump with other world leaders saying that they were going to now invade the South China Sea? Well, it's pretty obvious that the US intelligence community as well as corporate America are concerned with the malicious use of artificial intelligence and the creation of deep fakes and the impact that it can have on the US economy, the financial market, and even foreign policy. Besides, it also builds distrust. So let's take a look at how deep fakes are actually created. But before we do, let's go through a little bit of the history, shall we? Um, Back in, let's say, autumn of 2017, there was an anonymous Reddit user who uploaded adult videos on the internet under the pseudonym of Deep Fakes. He took deep learning plus fakes, concatenated them together, ergo Deep Fakes. Among the first of these adult videos appeared actresses like Emma Watson, Kay Perry, Taylor Swift, and Scarlett Johansson. So you can imagine how this actually created a media frenzy for them. And I guess the question you would ask is, well, why didn't they just sue? Well, that's a topic for another presentation, but can you imagine what they would have to go through? First, they have to get access to that particular social media platform. Then they would have to figure out who the actual person was who posted the information on social media. So there's a lot of legalities that you have to go through to actually obtain that information. 
But there is good news. If you can catch yourself, no, if you catch yourself in a deep fake video that you did not consent to, you can uh, sue the creator for $150,000. The state of California passed a law in October of 2019 that will see the banning of creating and distributing deep fake videos of persons who have not consented to the videos being made. But keep in mind from autumn of 2017 until that period in 2019 for those two years, these ladies had to suffer the consequences of what those deep fakes had done to them. So let's talk about how deep fakes impact businesses. We spoke about how deep fakes can impact the president, can impact government, can impact individuals. But let's talk about how deep fake actually impacts a business. So how can a deep fake impact businesses? Let's think about that for a moment. Companies have cybersecurity, right? And no one can penetrate a company's firewall. That has never happened, right? What about internal threats? Why would anyone want to harm a business? Well, for the money, right? I mean, hack, this is what hackers do. They do this all the time. And the malicious use of artificial intelligence is just another tool for hackers to use. There was one case in 2019 that involved an Israeli hacker who actually stole $8 million from a businessman by impersonating the French foreign minister over Skype. This is someone he knew. He was speaking with the individual. He was looking at the individual's face and the hacker using AI in a malicious manner created a deep fake where he was able to steal the $8 million from this particular businessman. There's another case where there was a deep fake created where the subsidiary company CEO that was located in the United Kingdom thought that he was speaking with the parent company CEO in Germany. This is someone he knows. He knows how the guy looks, how he talks, everything. So how was the CEO in the UK fool? He knew the German CEO's voice, accent, and the rhythm of his speech. Well, the hacker had samples of the German CEO's voice. As I've said, when you're an important person, there's a lot of information about you out on the internet. And who you think you're talking to may actually be someone very different. So can deep fakes impact the market? Can it manipulate the stock market? Hmm. So let's think about that. What about a deep fake created of Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk having lunch together? And then you see somewhere that someone says, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk were having lunch together and it was overheard that they were discussing the acquisition of Amazon or Google. Do you think that will pop the market? Do you think a lot of volatility would occur in the market? Speculation happens every day, but to actually see a picture of these two sitting down at a place having lunch and someone saying that they overheard it would definitely manipulate the market. What about brand defacing? What if I'm your number one competitor and I'm coming out on the market with a brand and I want to deface what's already out there to make my brand look better? Do you think I can create a deep fake to do brand manipulation? Absolutely. There was a study that was conducted by the University of Maryland, my alma mater, and the IBM Research Organization on Hurricane Sandy and deep fakes. And what they concluded in this study was that 85% of the retweets from Hurricane Sandy were actually deep fakes. 85% of retweets. So we need to understand what is real and what is not real. So let's talk about how deep fakes are created. Because as you can see, individuals who know people, 
individuals who are highly intelligent have been faked through deep fake. So how are deep fakes created? The main technology for creating a deep fake is deep learning, a machine learning methodology used to train deep neural networks or DNNs. Later, we will discuss convolution neural networks during the more well used case for IBM. DNNs consist of large set of interconnected artificial neurons referred to units, they're units, much like neurons in the brain. While each unit itself performs a rather simple computation, all units together can perform complex, nonlinear operations. In cases of deep fakes, this mapping from an image of one person to another is able to be created. So let's take a look at it, shall we? So there's a study that was conducted by the Kelly School of Business, Indiana University in 2019, in which Allison Bree was deep faked with Jim Carrey on his show. And these references, you can actually look at the YouTube. We don't have time today to look at it. But basically, deep fakes are commonly created using a specific network architecture known as autoencoders. Autoencoders are trained to recognize key characteristics of an input image to subsequently recreate it as their output. And this process, the network performs heavy data compression. So autoencoders consist of three subparts. There's an encoder that recognizes the key features of an input face, a latent space represents the face as a compressed version, and then a decoder, the restructuring of the input image with all of the details. So let's go into that a little bit deeper. So you have the actual photo or the video of the person. It goes through this coding process and then it gets compressed and then it gets recreated as an image. And so this is where the manipulation can actually occur. So when you're talking about that compression, you're looking at spatial recognition between the eyes to the nose, the nose to the mouth, the cheekbones, so forth and so on, when you're making various expressions. So let's do an experiment. Take a look at my face. Look at the distance between the nose and my bottom lip. Look at the distance when I frown. It's smaller. Look at the spacing of my nose and my bottom lip when I smile. Larger. And what about when I smirk? It's on an angle. So two separate autocoders train each other on a different person will be very different and cannot be integrated because everyone's face is different. The trick for creating deep fakes lies in sharing the encoder across two networks such that they remain compatible. This way, the image of one person can be used to compute a compressed Latin space representation from where the decoder of another person is used to create the fake. So, I know I've gone over a lot, but I think actually showing you an example would make a lot of sense for you. So why don't we go ahead and do that? So here, I'm going to show you, we talked about facial deep fakes, we talked about video deep fakes, but this is research that was done at the University of Berkeley, and this is a full body deep fake. While you're looking at this video, I want you to think about yourself sitting in front of a television, watching the news, and they mention your name that you created a bank robbery. And let's see how that would be done, shall we? But we're gonna do it with dancing because dancing is much better. So here we have the source. I'm gonna mute it. Here we have the target. And this is that Latin, that latent compression that we were talking about that was occurring. And if you notice, this is the full video. You have the person actually doing the moving over here. And then we have the target 
which is actually emulating based upon this input movements, which she is not actually doing. She's in the room, but she is not doing these movements. And if you notice, there's no background for the source and the target's background remains as it is. So here we have another source um, subject and we have the target. And again, we see the source is doing various movements. The target, as we saw in the beginning, is not a good dancer. And we'll get another chance to look at her again. But the first thing is, we do this, the three stages. Remember we talked about three stages? So there's this decoding that's being done. And then the compression that's being done. And then the image is being converted. So here, okay, that's just horrible dancing. So as I said, <laughs> we have this source video that has a complete background and he's doing all the activities. This is the target who is in her particular location. The backgrounds are not impacted, but also there's something else you should notice. The spatial distance between the way his legs are is different than the spatial difference of her legs. And the reason for that is because their height is different. Their leg length is different. So this is done for her. So we saw one person, now let's see how we can do this for multiple people. I think the second target is even worse than the first for dancing. So here we have two separate targets that are in two totally different locations that are being impacted by the actual source. So I'm gonna pause it here because I just can't take any more. And we're going to go back to looking at our slide deck. So as I said earlier, imagine you're at home, you're watching the news, there's someone who created a deep fake about you doing something at a location where, okay, you may have walked into the bank earlier today, but you did not hold a gun at someone, you did not do any of these activities, but that deep fake can show that you did. And it can also have a deep fake on all of the tellers or whatever at the bank. So you can definitely create a deep fake about a person and a situation. Because of this, many states, including California, Texas, and Virginia, have already enacted laws regulating deep fakes through criminal and civil causes of actions. So this area of the law will quickly evolve over the coming years, and there's definitely going to be a very large impact on privacy torts, First Amendment rights, so forth and so on. So stay tuned, because we're definitely going to have more on that. Hopefully, if I have enough time at the end, I will share with you some of the research that I am doing as I am a doctoral student at the American Public University System, Strategic Intelligence University, formally focusing on artificial intelligence with my research discipline being in deep fakes. So more to come on that. So let's look at another case study. This case study it's on the malicious use of artificial intelligence to empower malware. This is based on research from the IBM Research Cognitive Cyber Security Intelligence. They actually designed this malware and it actually works. You can actually launch an attack with it. So the IBM researchers package the malicious WannaCry malware in an artificial intelligence wrapper to produce what is called a targeted attack. And we'll talk more about that. So how does it work? The convolutional neural network is able to learn quickly. Its design is very complex and hard to analyze. This prevents people or analysts 
from understanding what is going on inside of the neuron network and the coding parameters that is inside of it. The hacker or hackers can use this to conceal the target until the target is identified and triggers the attack. The trigger condition to unlock the attack is almost invisible and impossible to reverse engineer as a result of the convolutional neuron network. I mean, look at it. It has eight layers and over 60 million parameters to analyze. Because of this, the malicious, the malicious payload will only be unlocked if the intended target is reached. So this target actually goes about and it's dropped on every location but unlike the initial malware, the WannaCry malware, it only triggers when it hits its actual target. So previous techniques would have been to use a template with your picture on it to deliver the payload. But template matching does not conceal the target and will reveal the attack. So rather than create a template, the artificial intelligence can generate a secret key inside of the payload. How does the malicious malware find its target using AI? Well, are there photos of you on the internet? Yes. What about your LinkedIn profile? Facebook? Pictures at, from work? Imagine sitting at your computer performing your daily task with your video camera on because you just finished a Skype. You didn't send any money to anyone or anything. No one tricked you yet. You're too smart. But you're at your computer. You just finished the meeting through Skype. And your camera is still on. Your face can be the key that triggers the malicious payload to execute and unleash the virus to cause serious harm. But it doesn't have to just be your face. It can be a software environment. It can be a user activity, such as uploading patches or patching a server. It could be a geographical location like the electric grid. It can be sensors like your HVAC system hits a certain degree. Or it can be a physical environment like the United States. So how does it work? The artificial intelligence deep locker works by using a concealment and then an unlocking process. So with the concealment, it basically, it hides the secret key. It goes about delivering the virus on everyone's desktop. And then when it actually hits the trigger condition, say like your face or that environment, it then goes to the unlocking process. And when it goes to that unlocking process, it executes and it delivers its payload. And here's the thing, it doesn't just have to be one virus or one ransomware. It can be multiple malicious activities within that payload. And the target can be multiple people. Remember the, the neuron network that we talked about, the six million parameters? That's a lot of parameters. So there could be one payload, one malicious attack targeted to the CEO, another one targeted to the Unix administrator, a different type of attack targeted to the database administrator. Oh, and definitely your cybersecurity team. There could be one targeted to them. Can you imagine the frenzy that this would create in a company to have this multi-layer, multi-trigger, multi-concealment type of stealth targeting artificial intelligence and powered malware delivered to a company? Can you imagine how when they think they fix one thing, something else pops up. Remember the layers and the levels that currently exist in the deep fakes? And how do you know 
that when you're talking to different people that you're actually talking to them because your systems have now been compromised. So this was just one type of example of malware that was generated by researchers because they first have to understand how does it work so that they can then defend against it. But the good news is that although this does exist and it's really out there, it is under lock and key and they're not allowing anyone to get hold of how they actually did it. They're not giving out the secret source, so to speak. And they did leave us with some best practices on what to do in order to prevent this from actually occurring. Same best practices that we always discuss that we know that we're supposed to do. One, you have to perform your code reviews. We all know about all the data leaks and all the things that we have within our code. We have to get real tight with coding and our standards have to really step up because through artificial intelligence, it will definitely find that weakness and it will capitalize on it. The next thing is, do not leave your default options turned on. Never leave your default options turned on. When you get new technology, I say turn everything off and then start turning things on as you need them. Understand what each function is for, what it allows access to before you turn it on. What always surprises me is when a new CEO or CIO or any senior level person joins an organization, first is broadcast, you know, on the internet, blah, blah, blah. We want to thank this person for joining us, coming from blah, 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 blah. They're now joining us. They're here with their significant other, these many kids of this age. You just told every hacker in the world how to get you. Kids of this age, they know what area you're in. They know which schools chances are your children go to. Boom, that's one great entry point because there's always emails and things coming from schools. Unfortunately, they're easy to hack. And because of that, that is why hackers target it. Another thing that surprises me is that when people move into their new homes, they allow the cable person to come in and set up their router and tell them their passwords and then they never change it. I'm always amazed at that. In my home, no one uses the router that I use. Yeah, I know it's expensive, but think of the cost to reputation and everything else if something were to happen. Have a separate router. Do not give that password out to your relatives and friends and the kids and, and so forth and your aunt who wants to download those cute little kittens and everything. Just don't do it. Don't give it out remain vigilant on what you do. So we understand the best practices, make sure that we stay with the best practices. I like to sum up with one thing and I wanna leave you with this thought. I want everyone to stay vigilant. And remember that with the malicious use of artificial intelligence, anyone can be a target. I'd like to thank you for joining me today. You can reach me at www.linkedin.com slash Valerie Drew. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. That was really, really interesting. Uh, for all the audience out there, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, as Valerie mentioned, you can reach her on her LinkedIn and we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.